I'm going to read it. Uh, I'll, rather, I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to do, kind of read a larger section today just to refresh us of some things. Um, leading up to the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. Uh, but before that, as, as you're turning there, I just wanted to ask the kids, and you have to be about Peter's age or younger, uh, to answer this question, but what is sin? Can one of you guys tell me what sin is? Emil, you got your hand up, you're fast. Doing wrong, okay. Can you give a longer definition? I know you guys have learned a long one. What's that? Worship you guys. Okay, I was looking for a, what is it? Maybe, maybe the motions will help you a little bit. Sin is anything. All right, for those of you who didn't get to hear it, he got it. But sin is anything that we do, say, or even think that uh, breaks God's laws and uh, makes God sad. So that's kind of a, a, a good definition. We can understand what it means. Uh, and so that's the issue we're dealing with here this morning, uh, that sin, when it entered into the world, was a simple thing, was it? I mean, God said, don't eat from this tree. They had one rule, Adam and Eve in the garden. And uh, Eve took, and Adam did, and they ate of it. And so sin entered the world. Did you know that before that there was no sin? There was, uh, life was peace. <laughs> it was peaceful. There was communion with God as he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and that fellowship that they had. But the day sin entered, it caused a problem. And the results of that have affected each one of us to this day. But it brought a separation between God and man. Our sin has brought that separation and the peace with God is gone. And so... Uh, it brought in, introduced into the world something that had never happened before. It brought upon uh, physical sickness. It brought uh, disease into the world. It brought pain and grief, sorrow, and even guilt. Um, and sin did not only affect me. And some people say that, well, my sin only affects me. <laughs> sin affects the people around you as well. Uh, and I won't take time to explain any of that, but um, it's, it's a disease, should I say, a disease that's affected the whole world, uh, affected every person in the human race. It, it, it's a disease, and I look at it as that, I think the Bible describes it as that, uh, a disease that affects the heart. Uh, it makes it, can make it like stone, and you have spiritually a heart of stone. It affects your eyes in the sense that it makes your understanding and your, your spiritual eyes are blinded. And the Bible calls that, you know, I once was, we sing, you know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. It caused blindness uh, spiritual, uh, spiritually to us and so on. Um, it introduced, uh, this disease is fatal. It brought uh, spiritual death. He says, you know, you were dead in trespasses and sins. So spiritually, we were dead. We we're alive physically, but walking around like spiritually dead people. And in the end, though, sin brings on also physical death. Uh, that's why people die. Uh, it is as a result, ultimately, of a sin and its effect. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 12, we're memorizing Romans 12. Uh, that says, wherefore, by one man sin, that's through Adam, and uh, sin entered in the world and death by sins. So death passed upon all men. Why? For all have sinned. It's the last enemy that God will destroy. And thank God that's going to be a fact someday. Looking forward to that. And you can blame sin on other people or other circumstances. Uh, I thought of Karen Hall in Papua New Guinea with... Uh, there, it's a, some of you have heard the custom that when somebody died, and apparently recently a rich man in a village 30 miles from her, uh, um, a man died, a wealthy man died, and somebody is has to be held responsible for that person's death, and they think it's a result of sorcery. So they're blaming his second wife, who has become a believer, 
they're blaming her for his death that she practiced sorcery on him. So their job is now to eradicate and take care of that problem by killing that person. And I was two Saturdays ago, they killed another woman. So when there's, there's death, somebody has to be blamed. It's, oh, she caused it by sorcery. You can imagine what that goes on in a village. And this is happening in our day. But the blame does not lie on his wife, does it? That man died because of his own sin. The sin that, uh, this, uh, Jesus said, the soul that sins shall die, right? So, but we can put the blame on, well, Eve made me do it. Eve said, well, the serpent made me do it. I mean, we, we've been blaming everybody else for it, but when it comes down to it, that sin has affected me and it's, it's, it's the cause of, of spiritual death in me and uh, physical death and all that'll take place. Uh, but something happened that we celebrate at Christmas. His name, it was told by the angel, his name shall be called Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now, I want you to, I, you don't have to look at it. We'll look at it a little bit later. But I'm going to read the story in Matthew's gospel. And, uh, or before I do it, let me see. Um, <clears throat> As, Jesus, as we look at Jesus in this passage here today, I want you to, to realize that he was a common human being. He did not stand out. You know how you got the pictures with the halo of Jesus around his head, you know, that dinner plate above his head? Uh, that's not real. <laughs> I think they're trying to point out who that is in some of the drawings and stuff. But the Bible really talks about Jesus, the Messiah that would come as just being an ordinary common human being. In fact, when Judas betrayed him, he didn't, he looked so much like anybody else that he had to point him out. He says, the one I go up and kiss, that's the one. That's the one who you were, I'm betraying. He looked so ordinary. And it says in, in chapter two of Isaiah, or on 53 verse two, it says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. All right? He, you didn't see Jesus after he came out, uh, you know, and Mary and so on. Oh, he's majestic. Look at him. The Bible, this, and again, Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus even came on the scene. But it's speaking of him, it says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, you had King Saul and when they saw him, they said, oh, here's a king. Look at him. He's handsome. He's tall. He stands head and shoulders above everybody else. Yes, he's our king. And God gave him that kind of a king. But when it came to Jesus, the king of kings being born on this world, he looked so ordinary, you wouldn't be able to pick him out in a crowd as far as physically did something different about, oh, he's majestic. Uh, and so he was just common. So as we read through this passage, keep that in mind. But I also want you to keep the first part of Isaiah 53, 5 in mind that says this. And uh, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities um, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace so three uh, things I want you to think about again as we read through the story as Jesus was being pierced that he was pierced for my some of your versions will say bruised uh, bruised for our iniquity. But it, I want you to put the word my in there. Could you do this as we read it this time? I want you to read the story. And when you see the pains and the wounds inflicted on Jesus, that to realize it was my sin that brought this about. He was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. And upon him was the punishment, the chastisement that brought us peace, that brought me peace. So I, if you can kind of keep your mind, it's a little bit different than maybe as you think about it. So when you see these things happen in the story, as I read it, uh, starting at verse 15 of chapter 27, Matthew's gospel, chapter 27 and verse 15. Now at the feast, the governor, Jesus has already been arrested, okay? Uh, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for one of the, uh, for the crowd, uh, anyone, any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Uh, so when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want uh, me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? And he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, 
While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, to Pilate, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. You find out Barabbas was, was uh, a, it only said a notorious prisoner here, but he was in there for insurrection and murder, sedition and murder. Notorious prisoner. And so the, the chief priests persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to him, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They said to him, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, or rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of the, this, uh, this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Wow. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Scourge Jesus. Now that was done with a leather thong. With on the end of it were bone, pieces of bone and metal. That when you actually struck the, the back of somebody with that, they would actually claw into them and pieces of skin are ripped off from the back. <laughs> horrible, horrible punishment. Horrible. But this is the beginning of the effects of, of my sin. It started before this, but I want to bring this out. Scourging, 39 lashes or whatever he got to find out if he could say anything that he was guilty of and so on. But they began to whip him there and he delivered him to be crucified. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry the, his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink of mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he was... He, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them and casting lots. And for they sat, <clears throat> then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Of course, they always wrote the crime of the person above his head. And what was Jesus? They had no crime. He claims to be, he's a king. So they didn't kill him for what he did, but who, <laughs> who, who he was. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. So those passing by. I mean, look at the crowd, the different kinds of people that are here. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saves others, he cannot save himself. Uh, he is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also uh, reviled him in the same way. Boy, it's, it's a rough crowd. <laughs> you got the passers-by, you got the religious leaders, and then you have even the thieves that are crucified on either side of you. Uh, verse 45, now from the sixth hour, that's from noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Strange things begin to happen here and there. All until the ninth hour. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it uh, said, this man is calling for Elijah. And one of them uh, at once ran and put a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on the reed and uh, gave it to him to drink. But the, the, but the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. 
And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And uh, coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. I hope we never get too used to that story and lose the, the, the wonder of it. But nobody ever was, has been so unjustly punished in this world before as Jesus was. I've heard of people, and you've maybe seen it on the news, and uh, of people who've gone to prison for 10, 20 years, unjustly charged, and now they find out they didn't do it, and they release him and unjustly punished because of something. But what about Jesus? He'd done nothing wrong. Jesus never sinned. You want to see perfect righteousness, you look at the Son of God standing in front of you. He's perfect. And I think there was a three, you know, they had to have a witness about three witnesses, usually two to three witnesses to to before murder. I kind of see this in, in a different way uh, where Judas cries out, you know, after he betrays Jesus, he says, I've sinned in that I've betrayed innocent blood. Witness number one, Jesus never sinned. Pilate, I already read to you, Pilate's wife, he's sitting in the judgment seat and Pilate sends a, Pilate's wife sends a message to him. Hey, listen, have nothing to do with this just man. I've suffered a lot in dreams because of him this day. So she says he's a just man. And then Pilate, after what she said, you know, says, I find no fault in him. Witness after witness after witness, just proving to you and me that the one who claimed to be sinless was sinless. There's witnesses of that, and yet he was crucified. And even the thief on the cross later on, who had a change of heart, said, this man has done nothing wrong. Hmm. So if you keep that, let's go to Isaiah together. Isaiah chapter 53. And I want to especially focus and read with everything that we've just thought about. Remember that Isaiah 53 came 700 years before Jesus was even born or on this, in this world. Let me, let me begin at verse one. Maybe it's hard to know. It's hard to quit at just one. I'm going to focus on three to six, but I want to read this. So beginning at verse one, Isaiah 53, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should at, uh, should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one uh, with whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And here's the beginning that I really want to focus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I think that's all I'll read for now. I could continue reading it here. Jesus was crucified. And Israel thought all the hardship is, is one day the, Israel, the, the Jewish people are going to read this and realize what happened. In verse 4, again, let me read it. Looking at it from their, uh, their point of view. Surely he has borne our griefs and our, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten my God and afflicted. Wait a minute. I thought when he died on that cross, he claimed to be the son of God. We blamed him for blasphemy. 
We killed him for blasphemy. We esteemed that God had stricken him. We thought we were doing God a favor, getting rid of this Jesus fellow who claimed so much blasphemous things. We esteemed him that way. We thought he was stricken of God. And their eyes are opened and they say, but as the verse begins, surely, surely. Now my eyes are open. I see surely he bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Eyes are starting to be opened up. Wow. How wrong was I? I was 100% wrong. We esteemed him stricken by God. In the we thought he was dying for blasphemy. But I realize now it was, he carried my sorrow, my grief, my sorrows. And then it carries on in verse 5. But he was pierced for our, and again, my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement or that punishment that brought us peace. So you have the words pierced, crushed, bruised, punished, wounds here. All those words are used because of me. Because of my sin. Hmm. My sin was the cause of this treatment that Jesus received. Do you ever think of it that way? This ill treatment? There, there's the mental Agony Jesus went through. Can you picture him in the garden before he goes to the cross? And he said he was he was in his sorrow was so great it was the death. And he said that the Bible says that he he even bled sweat drops of, of blood in this agony, this mental agony. The Father, if it's possible for this cup to pass, pass from me, but nevertheless your will be done. The agony, the mental agony that was going on. And then there's the physical stuff, which we just read about, the scourgings and all of that, the, the physical, the, the, the shame also that went with that. He would, they spit in his face. I feel like I skipped a part, did I, in reading that? I almost think I skipped a big chunk of what the soldiers did when they, after they scourged him. Anyway, they plucked his beard. They gave him blows to the head, hit him over the top of the head with a knee, blindfolded him. Prophesy who hit us, who hit you. And they weave this crown of thorns and put it on his head, causing more blood. And then the, finally, the crucifixion is that crucified man is, is there and they drop that cross into the, to the ground and the jolt that causes bones to be dislocated and eventually die of suffocation because he can't. Lift himself up to breathe anymore. Horrible thing. Physical. The things that happened to him. And those are all horrible. And Jesus bore them well. But I think the greatest agony for Jesus was this. Where, what we read today. Where, where Jesus cries out from the cross before he dies. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hmm? I, think, I think that was more painful for him than the agony and the physical pain he went through was because they were they had union with each other. The Father and the Son had never been forsaken. They had never been separated. And now as Jesus bears your sin and my sin, God can't look at sin. There's a separation that takes place. And he, he cries out in his agony. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I really think that's the hardest pain. You know, maybe you've experienced it, some pain of a relationship that is broken is sometimes more painful than physical things of breaking. I've broken bones before, but boy, severed relationships sometimes are more painful. But think of what this agony that Jesus went through in, in experiencing the full wrath of God on his life. Again, remind ourselves why it wasn't, it wasn't for his own sin. It was for ours, as they said here. In uh, verse 14 of Isaiah 52, if you just go back one page, or it says that, and many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. There's not only a bloody figure there, you can't really even recognize who is that. Mary knew it was Jesus. 
there at the cross, but as she looked up, she couldn't, she couldn't tell this is the son I raised. His face was marred beyond semblance. Again, but what caused that? My sin. Your sin. Verse 6 of Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned we have turned everyone to his own way. And isn't that the greatest sin? We've turned our own way. We've turned our backs on God so that we could go our own way and do our own thing. And he says, we all like sheep have done that. We've all gone astray. Astray from God. Astray and wandered off into this world that we thought was so great and doing our own thing. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on who? The iniquity of us all. On those sheep? Should that That's where it should have gone, should it? The Lord should have laid the iniquity on those sheep, but instead he lays it on the good shepherd who gave up his life a ransom for many. Hmm. He laid it not on the sheep, but on, on the Messiah, on my substitute. Do you ever think of that before? That Jesus was on the cross as my substitute, taking the sin and the punishment that I deserved. God punished me, sin, sin. God has to, doesn't he? God has to punish sin. And what we read about today in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, is we can see that, the punishment that, that sin deserved, the wrath of God being poured out. But it uses this, and I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. It ends up saying he was bruised. Okay, he was, I'm sorry, I, I say, I've learned it in one version, I read another, so sometimes I mix up words, okay, <laughs> just so you understand. He was, he was pierced for our iniquity, he was bruised for our Transgressed the chastisement that was laid upon him, you know, so that we could have peace. But then it says this, and by his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. This, this is what I want to focus on the last little bit here, or a little while here. <laughs> by his wounds, we are healed. Doesn't that sound strange? Isn't that a strange cure for our sin problem? Those wounds, look at those wounds. Those are strange way. God has strange ways of talking about these things, of dealing with this, finding a cure for our sin. It, those wounds brought peace between me and God. He, he not only took care of my sin problem on the cross, um, he freed me from the guilt of sin. I don't know if you guys ever got spanked. Dave got more than I did, I'm sure. <laughs> but we had spank, we had spankings in our family. I got in trouble, and I I always told my kids they they don't agree with the same thing I said. But I said I didn't get one spanking I didn't deserve. I, I deserved every single one I got. Uh, my boys say different, but I, well, I did the best I could. <laughs> but uh, you know. The anticipation of that, sometimes it was this way. So dad was home, mom sometimes did it too, but you know, I, I feared my dad more than my mom, you know, I guess. But so she would say, you know, I did something wrong. And so, well, wait till dad gets home. Oh, that was the worst, you know. You had sometimes hours to wait. Knowing the whole time you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get it when dad comes home. Because mom's going to tell him, I hope she forgets. Uh, she didn't forget you know, change your mind. But dad comes home and the dreaded moment has finally come. And dad always sent us to a room for a while so he could cool off if he needed. He's never spanked us in anger. But he'd cool off first, but he'd send us into a room. And that, the anticipation of waiting killed me. Let's just let's get this over with. You know, you can't enjoy it. You can be playing with your toys, but in the back of your mind, oh, it's coming, it's coming. Sin has to be punished. And so I would get in there and finally, however many stripes <laughs> I deserved, I got. It was painful. I think I cried almost every time. I didn't like it. But you know what? Afterwards, it felt good. 
I, I could go about playing again with no thought of guilt. It was dealt with. It was dealt with. The sin was punished. I'm not going to be punished for it again. I can go out and play with, with the thought of, and the guilt gone. Yes, I did wrong, but I, that doesn't bother me anymore. I've been punished. And God, it's the same way. Look at the cross that way. If you're walking around today as a Christian with guilt still, man, look at the cross. That punishment has been paid. It's not going to be exacted on you. God will not do double jeopardy. He took my sin. You know, this is God's remedy and God's only remedy for sin. By his stripes, we are healed. Now you're going to have people with white shirts, little name tags, show up at your house and try to give you a different remedy for God's solution to sin. You're going to meet other people who will give you other remedies, but this is God's remedy. No merit of my own. No deserving it. He only gives one healing for sin. And that's his stripes. His wounds. So those wounds, they're ugly, aren't they? But in another sense, my dad used to sing a song like that. Those beautiful hands. He's talking about the pierced hands of Jesus. And you look at those and you say, oh, that's ugly, isn't it? Really? Come on. But when you think, what does his stripes, what did those holes in his hands do for me? Those beautiful hands. Beautiful. And those stripes are beautiful when you think those stripes were what I deserved. And yet God took punishment from us. Let me, let me, I, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. If you wanted, would you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2? Towards the end of your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2. And he, Peter is talking about this very passage that we looked at. And in verse 22, it's hard to know where to start. I'm going to start in verse 22. So 1 Peter 2, verses 22 to 25. He committed no sin. Speaking of Jesus, right? We, we established this fact that he, he wasn't suffering for his own. And Peter says the same thing. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to he who judges justly. Oh man, if something happens to you, do what Jesus did. Entrust yourself to the care of the one who's going to judge justly. In verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep. But you have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. You return. We all went astray but uh, Peter adds this to it. Now you've returned to the shepherd. The overseer of your souls. The one who takes care of you. Now I was glad when they said unto me. Let's go to the house of the Lord. Right? Because there's reason, there's there's that sin problem has been dealt with. I rejoice to meet with him. He rejoices to meet with us. And go to chapter 3 and verse 18 of 1 Peter. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. That's me in case you're wondering. The unrighteous is you and me. Jesus is the righteous. So for Christ also suffered once for sin. The righteous for the unrighteous. That he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. And so those wounds were wounds for healing. The cross did two things, really. You see two things at the cross. In the story we read in Matthew, number one, we see God's. How, you know, you might not think of sin as very bad. But God looks at sin very seriously. And his wrath was poured out on this, on Jesus because of our sin. Okay, That's how seriously God takes it. He has to punish it. And he punished it with a capital punishment there. And the okay, so that's one thing you see there. You see the justice of God, right? Because sin has to be punished. If He's going to be a just God, then sin has to be punished, right? No judge would let a murderer go free and say, "Well, I just forgive you." There has to be some punishment. Jesus took it upon. But at the other side, you see too. The second thing is how much God loves you, right? Uh, the story of the cross and everything we read today is that. No one ever cared for you like Jesus. Hmm. 
No one loves you more than God. Jesus said, and you can quote this yourself probably, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus said, greater love is no one than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Isn't that what we just read? Greater love, Mesno. I love you. Why did, why did Jesus go to the cross? I love you. I care for you. Paul, the apostle, says he demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the ungodly. God loves you more than any person could ever love you. It tells us that he was willing to take the cost, the utmost cost upon himself. Pay the highest price. That there might be a way for you and I to be restored into fellowship with God. He died once that we might be restored to God. And we sing that song, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. He took the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. So what do we have to do to get this cure? Take the medicine. Right? <laughs> Simple. Receive it. What do you do with a gift that's been given you? Receive it. Take the medicine God provided. It's not enough to know, okay, there's this, and most people, I talk to people even this week, I talk to people I don't know, but I talk to them about what did Jesus do for it? Oh, he died for my sin. But it has no effect, personal effect yet on their life. They know the remedy, but it hasn't been applied. You think, remember the Passover? When they were to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the homes, the night that they were, and, and the angel of death would pass over that house because it had the blood applied. Well, everywhere where the blood was not applied, there was death in the home. But wherever there was blood, the blood has to be applied. The medicine has to be received. His wounds, by his wounds, with his stripes, we are healed. But it has to be applied. You and me. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. Here's what the Apostle Paul says about himself. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace. Unmerited. He didn't deserve it. And so he says this. And his grace towards me was not in vain. I believe God's grace has been extended to every single one of us here today. But will it be in vain or not? Paul says, as far as I'm concerned, it, when it, the grace of God came to me, it was not in vain. I took the medicine. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I used to kill people in the church. I used to fight against God in the church. And yet he's turned me into one of the leading apostles. And he says, and I don't deserve it. His grace towards me was not in vain, though. You know, there's only unworthy people in heaven besides God himself. <laughs> the only ones that will be in heaven are those who don't deserve to be there. You know, the Bible says in, in the book of Revelations that there's going to be multitudes from every nation, tongue and tribe in heaven. I don't know if you can picture, if you ever tried to, you've seen masses of people where you can't see, you know, as far as you can, the eyes can see. I just imagine a moment walking in there, into heaven and say, oh, look it, there's, there's that Samaritan woman. Is, she's, the one, she's the one who had five husbands. She had quite a record. And, and the boyfriend she was living with at the time, a living boyfriend that she had when, when Je the day Jesus met her, she had a living boyfriend. Okay? And Jesus came in. In a day, you know, that's not who you want to meet when you're living a life like that, is it so much? Your boss or something. But you meet Jesus and her life was transformed. She didn't deserve to be there, but she's there today. What about that short guy in the Bible? That short man that climbed a sycamore tree one day so he could see Jesus. Crook. 
a crook cheated people out of taxes. There's Zacchaeus way back there somewhere. In his. See it? Oh, who's that guy over there? Oh, that's a thief on the cross. What's he doing here? He didn't have time to get baptized. He didn't have time to do anything good. It was the grace of God. It was He was healed by the wounds of the man he was crucified next to. Those wounds were for him. And he doesn't deserve to be there, but he's in heaven today. Today, Jesus said, you're going to be with me in paradise. And there's a little a, a lady from Macedonia there, Rosa. Her name. She's crippled now, but in heaven she'll be in no wheelchair. By the grace of God, and by the grace of God, you'll be there. And I'm there, not because I deserve it, but because Jesus' wounds healed me. What should have been for me, he took. Traded my sin, was laid on him, so I could have the perfect life that Jesus lived. So let me, in closing, in light of everything we've talked about this morning, could you answer this question that Leonard Ravenhill used to put at the bottom of all his letters, and a question sometimes he'd ask when he's in preaching? If you're a believer today, to think about this question and answer it yourself, are the things that you're living for? worth Christ dying for? Are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? Is it just so we can get through life and retire and collect seashells in Florida? <laughs> if that's what we're living for or for the glory of God. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life my soul, my all. If I can do anything this morning, I hope that you'll think much of Jesus. That he's your Savior. I'm not. I can point you to him, but he is the Savior. And I hope that when you look at a story like this, as gruesome as it is, how beautiful it is too. And just... I say if you've never taken this medicine today, take it. It's the only cure for your sin, the stripes of Jesus. But if you're already and have experienced that joy, I hope that you can look at this in a, how do I say that, in a deeper way so you can love him all the more for what he's done. And uh, we're going to, we have communion set up here today and I'll ask Bruce to come up and uh, kind of close the meeting here with us taking communion. I, I think that's very fitting in light of what we talked about. This is, you know, the, the communion service. It's, we remember his death until he comes. That's what we've talked about today, his death and so on. So let's pray and then I'll ask Bruce to come up. But Father in heaven, again, it was for my iniquities that you were pierced. You were crushed for my sins and the punishment that I deserved was laid on you instead. But by your wounds, I'm healed. Thank you, Lord. It's a strange way to save people, but I thank you for it. It makes sense. You took the punishment that I deserved. So now if I receive that medicine, it will transform my life. I'll be yours and you'll be mine. And so I just pray, Lord, as we continue here in the time of communion, Lord, you would bless our thoughts and our minds as we take this together, Lord, and enjoy fellowship with you and with one another. Amen.